afternoon, everybody. Uh, if you could uh, please take your seats. We're going to get started here. So my name is Milan Kulkarni. I'm the Michael and Catherine Burkhead of the Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And welcome to today's Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, beginning in 2018, the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series has been inviting world-renowned faculty and professionals to Purdue Engineering to encourage thought-provoking conversations and ideas with faculty and students regarding the grand challenges and opportunities in their fields. Besides presenting a lecture to a broad audience of faculty, graduate and undergraduate students, they engage in an interactive panel with Purdue faculty and students. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Arvind Raman, John A. Edwardson, Dean of the College of Engineering and the Robert V. Adams Professor in Mechanical Engineering. Warm welcome to everyone gathered here and all those watching uh, this event online. Uh, it is uh, my distinct honor to introduce our uh, distinguished lecturer for today, uh, Jeff Dean. Jeff is the chief scientist uh, at Google, and in that capacity, he is responsible for AI advances, uh, not just at Google Research, but also at DeepMind, and also uh, for AI applications that are trying to solve problems for the benefit of billions of people uh, around the world. Uh, Dr. Dean has co-designed and implemented many generations of Google's crawling, indexing, and query serving systems, and co-designed and implemented major pieces of Google's initial advertising and ad sense for content systems. He's also a co-designer and co-implementer of Google's distributed computing infrastructure, including MapReduce, Bigtable, Spanner Systems, and protocol buffers, as well as the open source TensorFlow system for machine learning, and a variety of internal and external libraries and developer tools. Uh, he has, of course, been recognized in many, many ways. He is a member uh, of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, fellow also of ACM, and winner of the 2012 ACM Prize for Computing. Please join me and giving a warm welcome to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. It's a delight to be here. This is my first visit to Purdue, and I had a delightful time walking around the campus today. And I'm really excited today to talk to you about you know, a bunch of exciting trends in machine learning. Uh, this is work done by many, many people at Google, so I am just the messenger in many cases. Uh, but I think there's you know, lots of things happening, and I want to give you kind of a taste of, of what machine learning systems can do today that they couldn't do you know, even a few years ago. So with that, uh, let's see. That is not advancing. Why is that not advancing? Aha. Maybe that's why. No. We don't know why. Oh, there. Now it is. OK. Wi-Fi glitch. All right. So I think it's safe to say that machine learning has really changed our expectations of what we think computers can actually do. You know, it, you know, as little as 10 or 15 years ago, you didn't really think computers could see very well. They couldn't understand you know, spoken language very well. They certainly couldn't understand natural language commands very well. And now we are actually able to build systems that can not perfectly, but with some amount of capability, you know, understand speech, understand language, understand what is in the visual world around us. And that really gives us the possibility of building all kinds of new computer applications that rely on those capabilities. Um, increasing scale has been really important to this. So training larger scale machine learning models on uh, larger interesting data sets with uh, larger uh, uh, amounts of compute has really led to better results. And that, that trend seems to be continuing. Um, so that's partly why we now have these capabilities compared to uh, a decade ago. And the kinds of computations we want to run are actually changing pretty dramatically. If you imagine that a lot of computation in the future is going to be kind of deep neural network-based machine learning computations, that's a very different setting than traditional CPU-based kind of Microsoft Office or, or other kinds of application code that is sort of handwritten you know, C++ code. And that really gives us the opportunity to rethink what kinds of computing hardware and computing platforms do we want to run these kinds of computations on and what would be most efficient for that. OK, so just to give you a sense of what computers can do now that they couldn't before, 
Um, you know, image recognition, you know, being able to take the pixels of an image and then say what is in that image from one of 1,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 categories. Uh, audio waveforms as raw audio waveforms fed in and then producing a transcription, that's speech recognition, that has improved in quality as I said. Translation, taking in a sequence of tokens in one language and producing the corresponding, you know, tokens in another human language. Uh, or even taking in the pixels and instead of just giving you a category, giving you kind of a short description of what is in that scene. So that, that's pretty cool. Uh, but what's interesting is in the last few years, we've been able to reverse all those arrows. So all of a sudden, we can now have generative models where you can say, I'd like a bunch of pictures of leopards, please. And the model will go off and produce 50 leopards. And you can say, yeah, I like those ones and I don't like those ones. And you can sort of make use of those images. Um, you know, text to speech has been around for a long time, but the fidelity of that has improved a lot. Reversing the arrows in translation has actually been around for a while. Uh, but even the ability to generate uh, images that are faithful to not just a category like leopard, but you know, a cheetah lying on a car, and it can actually produce images that faithfully represent the language and the, the constructs uh, uh, contained in that language is something that modern, uh, modern image generation and video generation models are now able to do reasonably well, and their capabilities are improving all the time. So I think this is pretty exciting, the, the reversal of these arrows, being able to generate all kinds of different modalities from other modalities uh, gives you uh, a whole wealth of new capabilities that computers have. Um, just to give you a sense of how much improvement there's been in this field, uh, Stanford developed a benchmark called the ImageNet Classification Benchmark. Uh, and that contest has been running for many years, starting in 2011, I believe. Um, and then uh, there was a, a groundbreaking paper by my, my colleagues, Ilya Sutzgaver, uh, uh, Alex Krzyzewski, and Jeffrey Hinton, that used a neural network for this task for the first time. Uh, so there were about 30 entrants that year, and they were the only one that used a neural network convolutional neural network, and had a whole bunch of interesting training tricks for that model to prevent it from overfitting. And they got huge advances, huge increases from 50.9 from the previous year's winner to 63.3%, uh, which is a major, major advance in, in accuracy. But I think it's also worth paying attention to the increases that have happened since then. So that paper was groundbreaking, but there's been huge improvements in accuracy since then. So now we're at like 91% accuracy for the ImageNet challenge, and it's sort of, you know, not quite, but mostly outlived its useful life as a super, super challenging problem, um, because we know human level accuracy on this is roughly about that, that class, uh, because it's actually pretty challenging. You have to know 40 breeds of dog by sight and that kind of thing. Um, similarly, in speech recognition, and the time frame for this one is about five years shorter than the previous graph. Uh, we've seen major, major improvements in uh, reductions in word error rate. So here, lower is better. And you know we're now at 2.5% word error rate on this particular Libra speech benchmark, whereas five years ago, uh, or eight years ago, I guess, we were at 13%. Uh, OK, so all these advances really are coming from a handful of algorithmic and machine learning techniques that are based on deep neural networks and other kinds of approaches that rely on uh, essentially dense linear algebra. And so if we can build computers that are really, really good at dense linear algebra, that's gonna help us build more efficient machine learning systems. So uh, these, uh, we, we're now building you know, hardware that is much more focused on exactly these kinds of computations and can't do anything else really well, but really, can do these kinds of computations extremely efficiently. And there's major improvements from generation to generation here. As we explore the design space of machine learning focused accelerators as opposed to general purpose CPUs, which the computer architecture design space has been you know, much more explored over the past 30 or 40 years, whereas the design space in machine learning accelerators is a relatively newcomer in the last you know, eight or 10 years. Um, and these advances enable larger scale models with lower economic and energy costs to, to, to enable us to train you know, more capable models. Um, so the two special computational properties that make machine learning accelerators different and interesting are 
the neural networks and all the optimization algorithms that we use for them are generally quite tolerant of reduced precision. You know, they don't need full IEEE 32-bit or 64-bit precision, you know, even, you know, 16-bit floating point or 8-bit floating point even is, is perfectly fine, one digit of precision. Um, and generally, different machine learning algorithms that are important today are just rearrangements of different kinds of vector and matrix operations or other kinds of tensor operations. So if you can build essentially computers that are really good at dense, low precision linear algebra, that's the kind of accelerator you want to make machine learning uh, more energy efficient and higher performance. Uh, so we've been doing this for quite a while at Google. Uh, we designed our first generation of tensor processing units, TPUs, um, because we foresaw that deploying the models we were able to develop uh, in speech recognition and computer vision would actually be a huge computational cost if we actually deployed them at scale in our products. And so we wanted something that would enable these models to run much more efficiently on specialized hardware than on traditional CPUs. And so that's what TPU v1 uh, demonstrated and actually deployed in our data centers. It was about 30 to 80 times more energy efficient and more uh, performance per, per dollar uh, efficient than CPUs of the era. Uh, subsequent generations, TPU v2, 3, and 4 shown here, have focused on both uh, training and inference and also on larger scale systems. So rather than just a single chip board, as you see in v1, these were designed to be put together into larger configurations that I'll show you in a minute. Um, and the, you can see the performance per chip has increased a lot. Uh, the V3 and V4 ones add water cooling, so you have pipes going to the surface of your chip, which is always exciting, uh, and you want to make sure you don't have leaks. Um, and then these are assembled together into larger scale configurations that we call pods with uh, 2D or 3D toroid toroidal uh, networks. Um, you know, the, the V4 pod is 4,096 chips and gives you one exaflop of, of performance, uh, which is quite a quite a significant advance in the three years since the TPU V2 pod. You know, about 100x more compute, uh, not per chip, but per, pot, per system. Uh, and then the V5 one uh, is uh, roughly a little bit more than twice as many chips as the V4 pod, uh, and is about 4x of, flops of compute. Uh, yeah, and obviously, Communication bandwidth between each chip is super important for scaling these systems, as well as memory bandwidth to the, the uh, locally attached high bandwidth memory on each chip. Okay, then the other advances that have happened in the last 15 years are pretty major advances in how we model language. Um, so language modeling is a really important task for a number of different things. For translation, you know, you can imagine taking in some language, uh, some part of a sentence, and trying to predict the next word in the sentence. Uh, or for completion in your email typing, you know, it can take what you've typed so far and suggest you know, the next few words of the sentence you're trying to type. Uh, that's essentially a you know, very real application of a language model. And it turns out there's all kinds of other applications for language models that I'll discuss as they become more powerful and more capable. Um, so we've been working in this space for a while. I was a minor co-author on this system that really tried to use uh, simpler techniques. We essentially built n-gram-based models where you count how often every five-word sequence occurs in all the text you can get your hands on, uh, two trillion tokens at the time, uh, which is actually you know, what modern uh, language models are trained on today, but 15 years ago, two trillion tokens was a lot. And we actually built a system for our production Google Translate system that could use n-gram statistics and then use that with a uh, cleverly designed algorithm called stupid backoff, which did the mathematically wrong thing but was much cheaper to implement. When you look up a five gram and it doesn't exist, how should you, you know, use the four gram statistics in order to interpolate to the five gram you're trying to predict? Stupid backoff turned out to work great. Uh, and that just shows you that simple techniques over very large amounts of data are often quite effective. Um, then I and some colleagues uh, really were starting to look at how could you build distributed representations. So instead of representing a word as a single discrete uh, entity, like hello, 
could you represent, or you know, cat, could you represent it as a high dimensional vector? And then have points in space represent different uh, words or pieces of your vocabulary. Uh, and it turns out that if you have simple training objectives with a not particularly deep model, you just have kind of representations for all the words and then you try to predict the representation of that word from the surrounding word representations, or you take the center word and try to predict a few words out the representations of those words, that actually turns out to be pretty effective. And you build these really nice representations of words that capture kind of the the way in which that word or words similar to it appear in real language. So cat will be in a similar high dimensional point in space to kitten, to leopard, to lion, and maybe a very different part of the space than truck. Um, but one interesting property is when you train these models, the points in space are interesting because they represent the meaning of the word. But it turns out directions in this high dimensional vector space are also meaningful. And so you can effectively you know, see that words that are related by gender, king and queen and man and woman, you go in the same direction in that high dimensional space to get from king to queen as you do to get from man to woman. Or you go in a, sim a different direction to go from the present tense of a verb to the past tense, regardless of the verb. So from walking to walked or swimming to swam is roughly the same direction in this space. And so you can really see that these, uh, both the points in space are meaningful and the directions are meaningful. Um, then three of my colleagues developed a technique called sequence to sequence learning. It turns out a lot of, mo of problems you can model as taking in one sequence as input and then trying to predict a different sequence. Uh, they, their, their original motivation was language modeling, but it turns out to be a much more general abstraction. So you take in the English sentence, and then from the representation the model has built of all the words that it's processed in the input, now it sort of seeds a decoding phase, initialized with that encoder. So now you've encoded the English sentence, and now you're gonna decode one word at a time what is the corresponding French sentence. And you can train this model on lots of pairs of English and French sentences uh, that mean the same thing. And the model will then learn to translate from English to French based on that training data for new so novel sentences. So it's a really nice, elegant, simple abstraction for how to build a translation system. Uh, it turns out you can also use this to model not English to French, but interactions of the computer system as a conversational agent. So you take all the conversation that has come before, the multiple rounds of interaction, you know, I said, hello, how are you, computer? Computer said, I'm great, how are you? Uh, and then I said, can you tell me about something? That whole prefix can then be used to generate the next round of conversation as output. And so you encode the previous conversation and then you decode a token at a time what the next round of the conversation will look like. Uh, and that was done by, by two of my colleagues um, using essentially that same sequence to sequence model. Then several more of my colleagues developed a model that instead of what was being used at the time, which was these recurrent models where you have some hidden representation of state, a high dimensional vector, and then you read the next token, and then you update that state based on the effects of the previous state plus the new token. And then you kind of do this repeatedly for every token, uh, each token in sequence. Uh, in the, there are two problems with that process. One is you essentially have a very sequential step to this because you're consuming one token at a time in order to get to the updates for your next state before you can consume your next token. The other problem is that you've essentially collapsed everything you've seen before into a single representation vector. Um, and what these colleagues had the observation was, why collapse that? Why not just remember all the past things you've gone through, all the past representations at every position uh, and update it for the next token, but remember the old ones and then attend to all those representations to be able to look back at the past when you're generating tokens in the future. 
And so this is where the attention is all you need uh, title comes from because you attend to previous representations and then can generate this. It also has the really nice property that when you're encoding a whole bunch of text at once, that is a very parallelizable process. So now you can compute all the representations for 1,015 tokens of input in parallel uh, and then start decoding. And so that makes this a much more parallelizable and accelerator-friendly computation than recurrent models. Um, then some colleagues put these ideas together, a transformer-based model and the idea of using uh, kind of uh, encoding of turns of, rep of, of a conversation into a sequence uh, into a early uh, open domain chatbot where you could sort of chat with the system about anything. They had a bunch of nice observations about you know, safety and sensib how sensible the output is and how specific it is. Like you'd like a chatbot that actually is fairly specific, not just uh, very, making very general statements because that makes it more useful. Um, so there have been a bunch of advances in, in this space, some of which I just talked about. And then more recently, a bunch of advances in larger and larger scale uh, large language models and multimodal models. Uh, so the sequence to sequence work, the transformer work, and then a sequence of work from, uh, in some cases, OpenAI, like the GPT models, two and three. You can see a large scaling of one and a half billion to 175 billion parameters uh, for GPT-3. Um, T5 was released by some colleagues at Google as an open source model and was highly used for a lot of different things. Uh, it's an 11 billion parameter model. Uh, then we've uh, done a series of papers on Palm and Palm 2, uh, GPT-4, uh, Chinchilla and Gopher done by my colleagues at DeepMind, and then more recently the Gemini effort, which I'll talk, talk to you about, which is a multimodal model um, designed to sort of do a whole bunch of different things. So. This is a project that is a little bit more than a year old. We have collaborators from Google DeepMind, Google Research, and many other parts of Google. Uh, and the goal is really, how do we train the world's best multimodal models and then use them in all kinds of different ways across Google products? Um, and we had an initial public release in December and then a more recent release, and I'll talk to you about both of those. Um, so Gemini is really multimodal from the start. You know, A lot of the language modeling work starts with textual tokens and can deal with that and can generate textual tokens. But we wanted to be able to take in not just text, but also images, video, and audio uh, sequences, uh, inputs, and then put those into a large transformer model, and then also be able to decode a variety of modalities. I've shown text and images, image decoding here, so that we can generate images, or we can generate text, or we can generate audio. Um, and that, that's super important because you want the model to be able to sort of deal with all the different modalities it might encounter in the ways you might want to apply the model. Um, we uh, developed a few different scales of these models. The ultra model is really designed to be the largest model uh, and most capable model to really help us understand what new capabilities emerge when you train these really large scale models. Um, it can also be used as a, uh, even if it can't be deployed at very high volumes because of its uh, size and, and serving cost, it can actually be used to help inform and help us uh, design and train smaller scale models that are more capable. Uh, then we have our pro scale model, which is really good for our data center based applications. And we have nano based uh, scales of models that are good for things like your phone or uh, your laptop. Um, we've been building customized training infrastructure at, uh, in the software uh, layers in order to be able to deal with very large scale training. So those pods I showed you, we often want to train on multiple of those pods. And when you do that, you now cross from the, the sort of pods own custom high speed network with um, chip to chip connections and instead are now going to a neighboring pod in the same data center building and so you really want to then, yeah, well, you have to use the data center network when you go from one chip on one pod to another. Uh, and then within the same pod, you'd like to use the higher speed uh, optical network 
uh, and, and chip to chip network that exists within the pod. And so our software infrastructure kind of abstracts all that away from the ML researcher or developer. And you just say, I'd like to run this computation on this many chips. And it sort of maps it onto like different physical hardware and then decides what network transfer will be most efficient when chip A needs to talk to chip B. Um, and when you're training these models at very large scale, you, you know failures become more and more common because you now have more hardware and the mean time between failure of individual pieces when you have more pieces means that all of a sudden things are gonna fail at a higher rate than, than if you're just training on say 16 or 32 chips. Um, so minimizing failures is really important, uh, but you can't minimize all of them, you can't eliminate all of them. And also you then wanna minimize the time to recover when you do have a failure. And so one of the things we did was we, instead of relying on checkpointing to, to a, a you know, distributed file system, we actually relied on checkpointing into uh, memory on all the accelerators that were running the computation. And then you actually, if a machine fails, you have many redundant copies of it in memory on other machines, and you can recover in a matter of like four seconds instead of you know, five minutes or something. Uh, we actually then were able to achieve uh, quite high levels of reliability. So our previous model training for the Palm model, which is a smaller scale model, quite a bit smaller scale, achieved 85% good put, where good put is kind of the percentage of time uh, that model training is actually making forward progress. Uh, and w because of this fast checkpoint recovery and other techniques we developed for Gemini, we were actually able to get to 97% good put for the largest scale training run for Gemini even though it's you know, probably uh, considerably larger than the Palm Run. Uh, one of the most important things in training a model is what is the quality and, and breadth of data that you're representing to the model and, and giving to the model to, to learn from. Uh, so you know, we're training on a large collection of web documents, but also books and code. And because we want it to be multimodal, you want to train on you know, images as well as audio data and video data. Um, we have quality filters for all the data sets. Some are heuristic based and some are model based classifiers that can identify, you know, what is the estimated quality of this particular uh, piece of text. Um, and the final data mixtures and, and weights are determined through ablations, uh, essentially trying different controlled experiments at smaller scale of if we put in 33% code, what does that do to our downstream metrics versus if we train on 27% code? And you know that probably hurts some of the coding metrics but may make some of the multimodal metrics because we get to see more multimodal data uh, go up. And then you have to sort of make a, a careful and, and balanced trade-off of what, what properties you want from the model. Uh, so data quality is really critical, I think in the future, being able to estimate the quality and the benefit a model will get from a new example is a super interesting interesting research problem. You know, that might enable you to sort of automatically learn curriculum uh, in an online manner uh, and also be able to sort of get the most training benefit from the examples you, you can afford to put through your model. Okay. Uh, and then there's advances in not just uh, the training of the model, but also we are better understanding how to ask questions of the model to, in order to get it to do a good job on, on problems we care about. And uh, asking models to essentially show their work actually improves their accuracy, but also it improves their interpretability. So let me take you back to your third grade math class when your teacher probably said, I really want you to show your work in solving all the problems that you're doing because it will help me understand your thinking and you'll also be more likely to not skip steps and get the answer right. Well, turns out he or she was right. Um, showing your work, so if you give a model, uh, what is traditional with standard prompting is you just give an example of the kind of problem you want the problem to solve, the model to solve, and then you give it a new problem. So there's one worked out problem with the answer, and then there's the question I'd like the model to solve. John takes care of 10 dogs, blah, 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 blah. And then the model output you know, matches what the behavior it's seen. It says I should just spit out an answer, and in this case it got the answer wrong. But if instead 
you show the model the example with the problem worked out and the sort of intermediate steps, um, it get, and then you ask it to solve this problem. It will itself then show how to work out the intermediate steps for the new problem. And importantly, in this case, it actually got the answer right too, uh, which is a nice benefit. But you also kind of interpret what, how the model is going through the reasoning process and how it arrived at that, that answer uh, in a sort of more human understandable way than just the answer is 50 and you have no idea like what it is. So that improves uh, the ability of these models to give correct answers. And you see the same models with standard prompting are in blue with different scales of models on the x-axis. And then what you see is chain of thought, once you get to a certain model scale, uh, actually shows much, much higher uh, accuracy, successful solving rates for uh, a couple of different sort of uh, math-oriented math benchmarks. And you can really see this in a multimodal example from the Gemini Tech Report, where now uh, you're giving the system, you're prompting it saying, here's a solution to a physics problem by a student, and then we just give the image of this kind of slightly scratchy student handwriting. Uh, and then you say, try to reason about the question step by step. Did the student get the correct answer? If the solution is wrong, please explain what is wrong and solve the problem. And make sure to use LaTeX for math and round off the final answer to decimal places. So that's the prompt you give to Gemini. And then the output you get is, after it thinks for a little while, the student get, didn't get their correct answer. Student made a mistake in the calculation of potential energy at the start of the slope, blah, 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 blah. The correct answer is conservation of energy means the total energy of the skier, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, we can write this, canceling out the mass, solving for V, substituting, and then we get the answer is 28.01 to two decimal places, as we'd asked. Um, so you can see fairly complicated activity happening in this model, right? It's interpreting the pixels of the image uh, understanding the handwriting, understanding what kind of problem this is, what kinds of what what is being asked of the model. You know, please tell me if this answer is right, and reason through, and and then reformat the answer in LaTeX, and then we render it in in uh, not raw LaTeX, but we to be human friendly, we we render it in actual rendered LaTeX. So that's an example of what these models are capable of when you give them multimodal capabilities and pretty sophisticated reasoning capabilities. Um, Gemini evaluation is a really important aspect of the Gemini effort. So one, we always want to understand what are the model's capabilities, both on kind of academic benchmarks as well as internal benchmarks for downstream product uses that we care about. Um, and it really helps us understand not at the end, just at the end of model training, but also continuously as we're training the model, you know, how is the model doing on sort of math-oriented benchmarks? How does that compare with how we expect it to be doing on multimodal benchmarks or whatever? Should we be changing the, the training mix? You know, because these training runs are often many months long and you can do a handful of adaptations during the training run if you feel like you'd really like the final result to be better at math and maybe it's fine at multimodal. So if we down decrease the multimodal images a little bit and increase the amount of mathematical content it sees, we can then get a little bit better math uh, results from the from, uh, capabilities from the model while, without hurting the multimodal performance too much. So these are the kinds of subtle nuances. You're like looking at dashboards of graphs and all kinds of things for your many month training process, wishing your training process was one second instead of three months. Um, yeah, so uh, the Gemini V1 uh, ultra scale model actually exceeded the state of the art results on 30 of the 32 benchmarks that we looked at, uh, which is, uh, I think, a pretty good performance. We were pretty happy with, with that. Um, and I'll just quickly flash through several of them. There's a bunch of text benchmarks. Uh, MMLU is a particularly interesting one. Uh, it, it encompasses 57 different subjects in a pretty diverse set of areas like chemistry, you know, history, philosophy, international law, um, you know, math and various things. Uh, there's a bunch of reasoning oriented ones, some math oriented ones, and some code oriented ones. And we exceeded state of the art in seven of the eight here. Um, on image understanding benchmarks, uh, we exceeded state of the art on eight of eight. 
And these are things like MMMU, which is an interesting one because that benchmark was released a week before our tech report came out. And so we were like, oh, this is an interesting benchmark. Let's quickly run, run this and see how we do on this new benchmark we've never seen before. And uh, we got state-of-the-art results by a fair bit, which is nice. Um, and then there's a bunch of kind of uh, diagram understanding kinds of things, as well as other multimodal understanding. Uh, there's some video understanding benchmarks, which we sort of, uh, I would say, knocked out of the park compared to, like here, the, a lot of the results are way better than the previous best. And the other text ones, that's maybe a little bit smaller margin, uh, but it's nice to see. Um, audio benchmarks, uh, generally quite good. And multilingual benchmarks, uh, you know, four out of five. So, you know, I, I first, I think you can see how much evaluation effort goes into really understanding the performance of these models. You know, remember we're doing this not just at the end of writing the paper, we're doing a lot of this continuously throughout the training process to understand, you know, how is the model doing and so on. Um, okay, in context learning. So all of these models have a input that they can accept. And that input has generally got a certain length of input that it can deal with. Uh, and then they produce you know, outputs. So when you're having a conversation with the model, say that, that input just defines how long the conversation memory can be uh, before it sort of starts forgetting stuff. If you're putting in a document and asking questions about it, that input length defines how big a document it can deal with, or can you put in five or six documents uh, together. Um, and so I think it's important to kind of understand the distinction between training data, which is updating the parameters of the model. And you generally have way more training examples than you have parameters of the model. So all the training data you see makes little subtle adjustments to all these floating point parameters in the model, but they're all kind of mixed together, right? Like you've seen trillions of tokens, you're updating tens of billions or hundreds of billions of parameters, and that kind of has this nice property that it can understand lots of different kinds of inputs, but it means when you're looking for a particular piece of information, it's all a little fuzzy, right? You're sort of like looking through a, a window you can't quite see through to pluck out very particular facts. Whereas information in your context window really is kind of the raw data that is in that input, and then the higher level representations that have been built out of that raw data but it's not sort of polluted with all, mixed together with all the other training data. So having a large context window actually enables a whole bunch of things, which I'll show you now. Um, and this is what we did in our Gemini 1.5 model series, where we really wanted to push on having much longer context windows in order to be able to put in, you know, whole books or large lengthy videos or, you know, hours and hours of, of audio data in order to then be able to ask questions or summarize that kind of data. And uh, I'll show you a whole bunch of examples of why this is important. Um, yeah, so we then have a public preview offering that uh, actually the public can now use this model with one million tokens. And in our tech report, we demonstrated 10 million token uh, capability. And you can try it there. Um, one of the things in Gemini 1.5 is we used a mixture of experts architecture. So instead of having a dense representation of the model and then activating all the parameters of the model for every, every uh, input uh, or every token, we instead have piece paths through the model <clears throat> and we learn different pieces of the model to activate for different kinds of things. And so now you have different uh, pieces of the model with different kinds of sp specialized expertise that can be called upon appropriately. So if you're dealing with, you know, images of birds, the part that sort of can help you really understand poetry maybe is not active. Uh, and that enables you to have a very large model capacity so you can absorb a lot of training data, but where the model can then be much more efficient to both train and to serve. And this is building on a long line of work at Google on mixture of experts models uh, I was a co-author on the first one, and then a bunch of other uh, people have done many uh, really nice pieces of work uh, in this general direction of models that are sparse and call upon the right parts of the model at the right time. Um, so one of the things that's important is 
if you have a long context, can you actually you know, refer back to it effectively? And so there's a nice benchmark that uh, the person external to Google, Greg Comrade, put together that tests a model's ability to probe and take a particular fact that's been hidden in a whole bunch of text. And then you put it at different positions in the text. And then you ask the model, you know, okay, what was the, what was the secret number? And then it says it was 73. And then that would count as getting it right if the number was 73. Um, and what you can see is across audio, video, and text, no matter where you put the needle, the needle in the long context, it's actually able to retrieve it correctly. So green is good and red is bad. And generally, out to these very long context windows, 10 hours of audio, 100 and, or 10 hours of video, 107 hours of audio, or 10 million tokens of text uh, for, for uh, benchmarking, a million tokens is about you know, 600 pages of text. So this is like 6,000 pages of text. Um, so I'm just going to play this short video uh, just to give you a sense of analyzing a video-based thing. And I'm going to attempt to navigate this in the sideways way. And I'm going to make the subtitles go on. No, did I turn them off? I think I turned them on. And then I'm going to speed it up. Sorry. And then I'll just kind of narrate what's happening. So this is a video of... Yeah. Sorry, it's a very awkward angle to do this at. There we go. Okay, now we can press play. Great, okay. So we've put in a 44 minute, I think, Buster Keaton video, just the video frames, one frame per second, um, into the long context. There we go. Takes about 50 seconds to ingest. And now we're gonna ask the model, you know, find the part where a piece of paper is removed from the person's pocket and give me the information on it. That's the prompt we gave it. And it's able to find this particular point in the video and it can tell you what was in it. And now we're giving it a multimodal input. What is the time code when this happens with this funny little drawing? And then it can actually do that. <laughs> so you can really see it's able to reason about not just textual information but kind of sketchy, similar representation to the actual video uh, representation there. Um, there we go. Uh, so then we, we, oops, sorry, we published that video and then an external user decided to try the same Buster Keaton video and said, can you please summarize this? And sure enough, it produced a pretty accurate summary of what happened in the 44 minutes of video. Um, so that's nice. Um, in context learning, remember I mentioned you can like really attend to the information in your context window. So uh, one of the things we did in the tech report for Gemini 1.5 Pro is there's a language called Kalamung, which is spoken by 200 people, actually 130 people in Eastern Indonesia, Papua. Uh, th as you can imagine, there's almost no online Kalamung content. Uh, and there's a new benchmark created about Kalamung called machine translation from one book. So it turns out uh, Eileen Visser was a PhD student in the Netherlands and wrote her uh, linguistics thesis on a grammar of Kalamang, and she traveled there and wrote a 573-page thesis about Kalamang grammar. There's the very first part of the first chapter. It's some mix of English describing Kalamang uh, culture and language, and then some amount of Kalamang in there as well. Um, and so now there's a benchmark called machine translation from one book. Can a machine learning system learn from no other content than this one thesis and a dictionary of you know, a thousand English words and a thousand Kalamang words? Uh, can it learn to translate? Right? This is very different than most machine translation settings where you have English and French and you have 20 billion sentence pairs that you've trained your machine learning uh, machine translation system on. Uh, this is really you know, just the description of the grammar of the, of the language and a few examples uh, of words. So um, without the Kalamang materials in context, the model produces pretty much random output because it's never seen Kalamang before. Uh, and so the quality of the Kalamang output without that thesis is terrible. 
Um, but with the book and a simple bilingual word list, uh, it actually can learn to translate uh, from English to and from Kalamung. So uh, here's some human evaluation of the quality of translations. And we evaluated GPT-4 Turbo and Claude 2, uh, both of which can accept about half the book. They don't have enough context length to accept the whole book. And so there you see Gemini 1.5 Pro with the half book, which is comparable to the GPT-4 and Claude 2 numbers on the top two rows. You see Gemini 1.5 Pro zero shot. That means no information about Kalamung. And you see the translation quality is terrible. Uh, this is on a zero to six scale, I guess. I was going to say one to six, but clearly, clearly it's zero to six. <laughs> um, but then you see Gemini 1.5 Pro with the entire book in context. It actually can translate um, from both Kalamung to English and English to Kalamung at the level of a human language learner who's been using that material for you know, many weeks and months of study. Uh, so this is why in-context learning is super important, right? Because you have a task you want to do, Kalamung to English and English to Kalamung. You have no training data about it, but you have a little bit of material for it. And you can now translate English to Kalamung and Kalamung to English, as well as a human language learner would be able to do. Um, here's something someone externally did once we released the, the video, the, or sort of the, the API access. They took a seven second video of their bookshelf, and then they said, um, JSON array of books in this video. <laughs> and the first one failed a little bit because it didn't actually give them JSON, but it did give them the list of books, uh, many of the books in the video. Uh, remember, we're sampling one frame per second for our video input, so we probably didn't get that much. Uh, we got essentially seven images. Um, and then a follow-up prompt, you know, they, they coaxed the model into actually giving them JSON. And there you go, title of Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, structure and interpretation, the classics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of nice. Here's another one that someone posted uh, maybe a week ago. You know, video understanding, they said, uh, I showed it this 11 minute YouTube video of uh, most iconic moments in sports. And then I said, please give me this. So just to give you a detail, like here's the actual video. And in a table, please write the sport, the teams or athletes involved, the year, and a short description of why each of these moments in sport are so iconic. And there's the output. It's pretty good. You know, Ray Allen hits a game tying three pointer with 5.2 seconds left in game six of the NBA Finals to force overtime and eventually help the Miami Heat win the championship. So it clearly has some world knowledge that the, the, the Heat won the championship that year that maybe isn't represented in the video, but it also has understanding of what that is in the video that it's seeing and can sort of connect these, these things. Um, here's another example someone external posted. Uh, they uploaded an entire code base from GitHub and all of the issues. <laughs> and then said, uh, it was able to understand the entire code base, identify the most urgent issue, and implemented a fix. So here you go, urgent issues and potential fixes. This is the output of the prompt, which I think said something like, can you please identify the most urgent issues and potential fixes? And then here's a potential fix for issue number 980. On finish handler is called twice, and it suggests, you know, adding a flag to track whether on finish has been called, and then only calling it once, which seems good. Um, so I think that long context capability and the multimodal capability are definitely things that you're going to see more of in the future. I think like right now, we're sort of experimenting with what happens if you have a video in the context. What if you could get many videos in the context and sort of be able to ask you know, questions that connect things that are present in different videos. Um, uh, similarly, for large amounts of text, like could you get all the course materials for all of your courses in context and then ask questions? You know, that might be good for students. Um, uh, the other thing we, we've been doing is producing open source versions of some of these models at the scales we think are really important for, for running on device and in uh, various settings that, that people want to deploy on premise. Um, and so Gemma is uh, some models we introduced in February. 
Um, they're based on a lot of the ideas in the Gemini models. Um, and let's see. Uh, we compared them with a few other popular open source models at the time of the release. Obviously, the open source community moves fast, so there's new ones since our report in February. Uh, these are the ones we compared to. And uh, Gemma 7B model gave the best results on 12 of the 19 benchmarks we looked at. Um, so it's a pretty capable model, uh, you know, built on a lot of the ideas that uh, came from the Gemini model series. Um, and, and it even punches above its weight compared to, say, Llama 13B uh, or the Mistral model. OK, so another trend is that ML is actually running in a lot of places uh, in, in your life uh, that you may not know about. So a lot of things actually on our Android phones and Pixel phones are influenced by machine learning. So the computational photography in the, the Pixel cameras is, uses a whole bunch of different kinds of aspects of machine learning. Um, we have a new feature called Magic Eraser, where if you've taken nice photos but you don't really like the telephone poles, you can just kind of point at one of the telephone poles and say, remove these. Or if these people are annoying you in your uh, waterfall picture, you can say, point at the pe people and, and remove them. Um, and there's a whole bunch of features on the actual product itself that kind of naturally enable you to transform one modality into another or you know, help you with uh, dealing with uh, interactions with other people. For example, you can um, screen a call where the phone itself generates natural sounding voices to say, hi, I'm helping Jeff with, with his phone. Can you please say who it is and, and why you're calling? And then that will transcribe that on your screen so you can, like, in a meeting, you know, see who's calling and see if it's something you want to uh, pick up on. Um, or read it can enable you to read uh, online material. Uh, so you can take sort of textual data and transform it into audio data. Um, Duplex enables us to make calls to businesses and say, hi, I'm an automated assistant helping Google Maps. Can you please tell me if your opening hours are still 8 AM to 6 PM? And we've actually uh, done that. Uh, and that influences a trillion Maps views, uh, the sort of correctness of that data uh, that we use to get local business information with the most natural interface for them, which is voice. Uh, and it can also help in a lot of settings where perhaps uh, someone in a lower literacy setting can actually get uh, you know, text on a box transcribed into their native language so they can understand you know, what, what the ingredients are of this, this thing. Uh, another important trend is refinement of these general purpose models into domain specific ones uh, seems to still be better than just trying to get the general model to be good at everything. Uh, so for example, we've been focused on some uh, applications in healthcare. So we take a general model. In this case, we were starting with the Palm 1 model or the Palm 2 model. And then we trained those models further on medical uh, text, like uh, medical articles and so on. Uh, and what we found was that you can get the model on the Palm 1 model actually achieved a passing score on the medical uh, boards exam. Uh, and then when we used the more capable Palm 2 model as the baseline and then trained that further, we got an 86 and a half, which is like expert level medical boards uh, passing score. Um, and then this is now actually out as a cloud product so that healthcare organizations can see how they can make use of this model in their, their workflows. You know, often it's sort of something where you can help clinicians make decisions together. I think you don't want to necessarily put this in a place where it's actually replacing the clinician's judgment, but really augmenting it in a way where you can give instant helpful advice about some rare condition that maybe that clinician hasn't necessarily seen, or you can advise, you know, you might think about this other thing, you know, the symptoms sound like this, but it could also be this. Um, and so I think, you know, you'll see a whole bunch of use cases in the health setting, although the health setting is quite complex. Um, I think I'm going to skip most of this, but there are cool images you can generate. I think people have uh, been enamored of cool imagery where you can generate images from text. We have a couple of different models that have different underlying ML algorithms, but they're really nice and capable, both, both of them. 
and we're learning uh, the strengths and weaknesses of each and combining them. Uh, you know, I'll just flip through a few of these examples. The prompt is on the left, a steam train passes through a grand library, oil painting in the style of Rembrandt. And there you go. Uh, a giant cobra snake made from X, where X could be corn or pancakes or sushi or salad. Uh, and I think the salad one is my favorite, the vicious lettuce. <laughs> Um, you know, a photo of a living room, that was maybe not so exciting, but even pretty detailed prompts. A high contrast photo of a panda riding a horse, blah, 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 it's wearing a wizard hat and book, and the horse standing in the street against a kind of blah, 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 a piece or painted them all. Uh, DSLR photograph, daytime lighting. Pretty good. I mean, it's not photorealistic, but it's getting better. Um, yeah, these are just a couple of external reactions. Uh, I'll skip this, but I want to highlight the importance of scale, right? So if you train these image generation models, a 350 million parameter model, and then you train a 750 million parameter model, 3 billion and then a 20 billion, and you give it the same prompt, you can sort of see the evolution of capabilities of these models, right? The, you know, asking for a portrait of a kangaroo in front of the Sydney Opera House, the first one kind of knows what a kangaroo is, but not really, and definitely doesn't know what the Sydney Opera House is. And then you see the kangaroo and the Sydney Opera House in kind of like a very sketchy uh, polygon form emerge. And then the later ones, you actually see the text isn't right, but the Sydney Opera House got better. And then the last one, you see a pretty good kangaroo. The Sydney Opera House is pretty detailed, and the sign actually has the text you wanted on it. So scale matters in these problems. And that's just a graph saying the same thing. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, I'm just going to touch on weather briefly. So traditional weather forecasting is done with very large scale physics simulations uh, uh, running on very large supercomputers. And you effectively try a few maybe 20 different models that you're exploring different, slightly different starting conditions of based on the current weather today. And then you roll those out uh, with hours and hours of computation in order to then land on an estimate of what the weather conditions are likely to be a day or 10 days or whatever from now. Uh, and that's traditionally been done with these very large, dense numerical methods. Um, what we're actually able to do now, though, is uh, take an observation of the current state. And because you can then train on um, past weather and current weather in many you know, shifted windows, you actually get what was the conditions and then what did they become as training data. And so that enables you to now build a model that can just go directly from observation to a forecast. You know, Take the current conditions, predict what they're going to be 10 minutes from now, an hour from now, two days from now. Um, and that takes order seconds, which is quite nice. Uh, and this gives you, you know, something that is uh, really high quality forecasts, and it outperforms the state of the art supercomputer based method uh, for 12 hours ahead. This was a couple years ago. Now we can do medium range forecasting, which is out to 10 days. Uh, we, and we actually better predict outlier events, which is really important. Um, and then more recently, a new technique uh, developed by some colleagues in Google Research is able to generate an order of magnitude more samples of what might the weather look like in the future. Uh, and that enables you to really get two, two sigma and three sigma kind of weather events better predicted because you have many more examples you're trying to you know, understand this distribution. Uh, medicine, I'm going to uh, just show you that uh, medical imaging now works, now that computer vision works. Um, and there's a whole bunch of state-of-the-art, you know, results there. Um, and we do more than just publish. We've actually got diabetic retinopathy screening rolled out in uh, Thailand, India, France, and Germany. We're screening, you know, tens of thousands of patients a month. Um, and you can actually do lens uh, pictures of something on your skin and say, what is this? And it will give you an assessment. Um, I want to close with how important it is to really focus on sort of how you think about using AI to solve different problems in the world and what problems you want us to solve and how you solve them. 
And really, this is what our AI principles are all about. You know, in 2018, we were seeing more and more widespread use of AI across uh, our products with people who sometimes didn't have deep domain expertise and how, you know, what are the kinds of issues that can crop up with bias or fairness in the data you're training on, things like that. And so we published, we created this set of principles internally, and then we decided to publish them externally because more and more organizations around the world were also starting to use machine learning. And we really wanted people to be aware of all these issues as they're thinking about deploying AI systems. Um, and there's lots and lots of research papers here. I would point out many of those areas are not solved problems. They're sort of, we know some things to do, but we don't know all the things we should be doing there. And so active research in those areas is really important. All right, and with that, I'm slightly over time, sorry. Uh, but in conclusion, I think AI is really changing what we think of computers as being able to do, is changing the capabilities of these systems. You see in some of the more complex reasoning where you reason from the scratchy math problem the student wrote or the complex video you uploaded and ask it like really high level questions about what's going on, uh, it's actually able to do pretty impressive things. So, cool, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you.